Hi Paul, thank Hi, you for Maris. being here. It's a great occasion that you are here in Romania. You are one of the five RST trainers who are visiting us and we thought, okay, what a great occasion to meet and speak. We also spoke with Hybe. And can you tell us about you uh, as a start? I know it's a lot. Just <laughs> as you say, how long do you want this to be? <laughs> just as an intro and then... Just a high, high level? Yeah. I was born in, no, I, uh, I uh, started software testing in 1995. I started as an automation tester. Uh, I wrote automation for about five years and I became an automation manager. Uh, I met Ross Collard in 2000 and Rob Sabrin, and then I met them again in 2003 and James Bach. I met him in 2003. In 2006, I had James come and teach RST at uh, Alcatel, or um, yeah, Alcatel where I worked, and then uh, had him come back in 2008, I think it was, or am I, ah, I'm getting the numbers mixed up. Uh, but he came back and during his second visit, uh, I said, I would like to uh, be an RST instructor. And I was expecting him to say, no. No one else is an RST instructor, but he didn't. He said, I think you'd be an excellent RST instructor. And I said, so what do I have to do? And he gave me a massive list just off the top of his head. And I started to write it down and it was 12 or 14 things that I had to do, including co-teaching with him, co-teaching with Michael, doing every exercise with each of them. It was a really long list and it took me probably about two years to work through it. And uh, I did. I, whenever I could, I worked through it. And then in, I think it was 2010, I became, uh, I, I did something with James. I can't remember what the final step was. And he looked at me and he said, that's it. You've done everything. You can be an RST instructor now. And I was just, what? So uh, I taught internally at Alcatel for a couple of years. I ran not very many, four or five courses total over the two years. And then I got out of uh, Alcatel in 2012, April, and uh, started teaching for James. Uh, and then I did that for about a year and a half, and then I moved to New York where I taught uh, software testing for underprivileged and underemployed people in the Bronx in New York City. I worked with Keith Klein on that one. And then uh, after two and a half years, I moved to Metadata uh, as a senior uh, director of testing there for four and a half years, and now I'm with Saxoff Fifth Avenue as a senior test automation architect, which is a fancy title for I don't have any direct reports and I'm working on testing with a focus on test automation. So what is Rapid Software Testing for you? James always says, hey, this is what I do, but make it yours. Yeah. <clears throat> and RST, what is RST for you? Uh, and why rapid? I mean, why is it rapid? Yeah. The it's it's rapid because uh, we've gotten rid of or, you know the methodology or the mindset that James and Michael came up with is to eliminate waste, to eliminate things that just take time that don't generate um, uh, really any value. So things like writing out a test script uh, takes hours uh, to, to write a good test script while uh, you could probably just write a sentence to cover the intent of it and then um, execute the intent of it in a different way each time in an exploratory manner where you would not take the same uh, path through the minefield over and over and over again you get to to try uh, different paths uh, one analogy that i came up with is it's like looking for easter eggs uh, or something hidden in a house, but you always look in the exact same spots. So you walk into the house, you turn left, you go into the living room, you look under the couch, you look behind the curtain, you move a cushion, then you go into the kitchen, you open the fridge, you move the milk, you put the milk back, you close the fridge, and you find all the Easter eggs that are in those spots, and then you go into the house the next day, and you do the exact same search. Are you going to find more Easter eggs? No, only if someone hid an Easter egg where you've already looked. So if you're running the same uh, scripted test uh, over and over and over again, it's only going to find new bugs that are put in the way of where you were doing your your um, 
uh, you're searching. So it will find newly introduced bugs, or it could find newly introduced bugs, but it's not ever going to find a bug that it missed. It'll just continually miss it. Now, if a person is doing it as opposed to automation, they may be observant and they may notice it outside, or they may deviate from the script knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, but that's sort of the, the difference. The uh, automation is needed and helpful and uh, if it's done well to give a good sanity check of the product and to find obvious or uh, newly introduced bugs that are um, uh, in the checking area that you're going through. Uh, but you still need exploratory testers to go in to examine the product and do things that uh, people might do by mistake or uh, malicious users might do on purpose or just uh, to use the product in ways that your users may but aren't frequent enough that uh, or important enough flows that uh, warrants the overhead of having a automation which then needs maintenance and every failure needs investigation you don't need to automate everything but you do um, have your your common flows, your important flows automated, and have exploratory testers uh, look for other things. But that wasn't the first question you asked. How is Episoft testing for you? Yeah, what, what is, is it for me? me? Yeah. So it was uh, after James uh, taught RST for us the first time in 2006, uh, I thought about it for quite a while and then just before he came back in 2008 I started to implement rapid software testing uh, session-based test management um, with uh, which is an element of RST it's not arguably part of RST but it's uh, one of the tools you could use and the um, the, the way that it had been explained to me was it's an hour and a half session and you have a charter and you you write your, and it, it was it was in you know in 2008 it was still fairly new and it was um, this is the sort of the structure of session based test management and I tried to implement that and then it wasn't working for us so we actually because of the complexity of the system we were testing we went from hour and a half sessions to half day sessions so we had a session in the morning a session in the afternoon it's supposed to be uninterrupted but my team was a support team uh, for all the other testing teams because we were uh, testing the physical layer of dsl so whenever anybody had a problem their modem wouldn't connect or something they would come and ask my team for help so to have an uninterrupted hour and a half was impossible uh, to get any meaningful testing done in an hour and a half was impossible, so I, we modified it. Uh, we uh, went to half-day sessions, allowed some interruptions, uh, were less concerned if, if a session bled into the, uh, into the next time frame. So we became very unconcerned about the time and more concerned about um, achieving the, the charter. And when I mentioned it to Michael Bolton at a TWIST conference, the Toronto Workshop on Software Testing, I remember feeling almost embarrassed that it was different, that it wasn't what had been taught to me. And so I explained what we had done, how we'd implemented it, how it was going. I had a whiteboard with stickies on it that was moving across, which I think if you Google, you can find uh, pictures of it. I know James and Michael both use it in their training. Uh, but that was back from 2008-2009. And uh, when I first mentioned it to Michael, uh, I remember very clearly he said, that's amazing. And I went, like I was expecting him to say, that's not how we do it. And I don't know why I was thinking that, it made no sense to me. But it, it was, uh, he was very pleased that I had taken what had been taught and made it my own, adopted what made sense, cut out what didn't make sense, and we were very successful. We did it for two and a half years, having session-based test management as the only form of testing that my team did. Uh, and uh, when I teach RST, and I know James and Michael uh, do this a lot more now than, than way back uh, in the earlier years, that what we teach as RST isn't a prescription. It's not, this is how you must do it, or anything like that. It's very clear that here is one way of doing it or here are some tools and you can take the tools that you want and the tools that don't work for you don't feel you have to use them if you need to modify it because it isn't prescriptive there's no one set of rules that can work for uh, any uh, anyone and will work for someone else 
So uh, even though I have a set of preferred methodologies that I use, every single team I work with has variations on the implementation and the details. And it's just you fit it to how it works for you. And there is another example of how you adapted it initially, what Michael, James, you, Hype, Griffin presents as product coverage outline. Actually, it was called test coverage outline. The test coverage outline. And you adapted it or mm. to, to be product. Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. So when James first introduced the what is now the product coverage outline, he called it the test coverage outline. And because of the name, I thought of it as a test plan. And it was the list of tests that I was going to be covering. Test coverage outline. Here's my tests. So I, I knew it had areas of the product on it, but I, I was listing off how I would test those areas on the test coverage outline. And James indicated that although it's not wrong, uh, as there's very few things that are wrong if it works for you, but that his intention was to have just a list of elements uh, that might be of interest to some testing mission. So it could be parts of the product, could be parts of the user interface, data, users, uh, typical flows, uh, the whole San Francisco depot, structure, function, data, interface, platform, operations, and time, all of those things, but not how you're gonna test them. It's just listing what you may be interested in testing. And so I suggested to James, uh, that we change it to product coverage outline. So all I did was change the name. Yeah. But my innovation came a couple of years later. I think it was exactly two years later. I believe it was in 2012, maybe, uh, that PCOs were um, thought of. Uh, and then in 2014, I created a really bad PCO. And it ended up being very fortunate that I did. I didn't have time to create the detail of the whole product. I was working on a financial institution um, uh, in the southern US uh, for a consultancy. And I went down and I was showing them how to make a product coverage outline. And we had to do some testing that afternoon for an emergency fix release. So we hadn't finished expanding the parts of the product that weren't involved in the emergency fix. So we have a product coverage outline where the areas that were adjusted, which if I remember correctly, was search and holdings. Um, those areas were spanned out plus a few others. And then there was like client details and logging and reporting that were just blocks of those elements and not broken out at all. And then we color coded it to show what coverage we were going to get in the testing we were gonna do that afternoon. And we showed it to the team and the developer loved the idea. He looked at it and he said, oh, this is clear. I can see what you're gonna be testing. And he really liked it. And then he looked and he said, oh wait, these two areas here, which we had listed that we were just gonna do a little bit of testing on. He said, these two areas are both touched by our fix. You should test those more. So we upped the coverage and the, changed the coloring of those areas. Then the tester and me went and did the testing. We made sure the color coding was correct as to what we'd actually did. And then we presented that as the test report for what we had done. So uh, I later, it was probably about two years later when I was at Metadata, realized that if you take the details of a full product and you trim off the edges from the product coverage outline and you just list the main components and maybe down one or two layers, but so it's not overwhelming. And then like a magnifying glass, uh, if you're looking at a map of New York State, there's a magnifying glass on New York City where you can see the details of New York City. So in a release coverage outline, you have a, a, a skeleton, I guess, of a PCO, and then the zooming in on the uh, elements that have changed for this release that's coming up or an emergency fix or whatever it is. And then you color code in that whether you tested it. And I tend to use six levels which is no testing, uh, sanity test, one or two happy paths, more than sanity testing, uh, some error conditions, but still primarily happy path. And then, uh, so those are the, the levels that you could achieve with scripted testing in my mind. And then uh, I usually color those red, dark orange and light orange. And then for areas that you pretty much have to do exploratory testing as common paths, which is, you think of pretty much all the common paths that your customers would use. 
um, including error paths and uh, things like that. Uh, I color that one yellow and then there's a light and dark green to cover off uh, how many corner cases you're doing. Some corner, so all common paths plus a few corner cases where you're looking at air conditions, state transitions, data flows, things like that. And then a dark green, meaning you've tested it uh, fairly thoroughly as much as you can. I rarely ever use the dark green and I leave it on the legend because I want to show that um, getting to a yellow coverage is more than we used to do when we did scripted tests and it's okay. Light green is even better. Even dark orange is uh, light orange could be okay or dark orange if you just need to do a sandy check. Uh, so anyway, that became uh, the release coverage outline. That was a really long answer. Sorry. It's okay. What is important to say is that the, the artifacts we can produce from RST are okay in case of audits. So yeah, so can you touch on it? I can. Um, <clears throat> I was involved in a project at uh, one of my former companies in the last five years that it was, uh, I have to be careful because I, I can't say too much about it, but it involved extracting some data from one customer's database, uh, which had sold an area of their business. Uh, so they, th this company was purchased and the one section uh, was sold off separately. So uh, they had like a thousand elements that were theirs and they had to peel out from their uh, database, which was a very complicated the person who had created the database originally back in the early 2000s when he congratulated us for having done it, he said, when I designed this, I designed it to explicitly not be able to do what you just were able to do, which was essentially peeling out those uh, six elements and putting them in a fresh database. And for us to have tested that in the methodology that our company had been used to up until that time would have taken probably nine to 12 months and we had a six month total window to get it done and delivered for the sale to go through. So I came up with a very much more rapid software testing approach where we had listed um, just the test scenarios and uh, my test plan was essentially just details on who was gonna be involved and the high level scenarios that they were gonna run. So it wasn't a detailed script, but there was high level steps, uh, probably between three and seven per script, even though the scripts would probably have taken half an hour to an hour to run, it was very high level. Uh, essentially uh, didn't say like log in, navigate, click here, click here, but it said, um, you know, log in as an administrator, go to the configuration screen and take screenshots of the configuration because we had to show the configuration was the same. And so uh, then we used a, a capturing, uh, testing capturing product. The one we used was QTest Explorer, uh, which uh, was, was very good for what we needed. It created a, a PDF that had a screenshot, showed where we clicked, when we clicked and what we typed. And so, uh, I convinced the internal auditors on our company that it would work, but it took a lot, it took a lot. <laughs> but she finally uh, agreed that, that it would work. And then we had to convince the company that was buying the, the, the spin-off part. And they were insistent that we do it the old way. And so finally in a meeting, I said, okay, we can do it your way, but it's gonna take an extra six months. And the guy, what? And I explained why it would take an extra six months and what the overhead was. And he very reluctantly said, okay, but if we get in an audit, you need to be able to support us. And I said, okay. Uh, I later found out uh, it was almost a full year after we had completed the transfer and it was a success and everything was happy that this company had gone under an MHRA audit. So the British uh, uh, FAA essentially, uh, FDA, that had nothing to do with the flight attendants or uh, flight administration. So uh, the FDA equivalent in, in England, the MHRA, which in my experience have been very harsh auditors, uh, very, very nitpicky. Uh, they did an audit of this transfer and they had no comments, zero comments 
on the test report. They had comments on other things, but they had no comments on the test report. So when that made it back to us, uh, that was fantastic. I was very pleased with that. Regarding that, uh, James Christie, it's investigating a lot uh, the U uh, UK post uh, postal scandal, yeah. where people committed suicide and so on. And it was something which uh, uh, surprised me a little bit when the judge gave the sentences and so on, when tried to justify it, they didn't look at the requirements and all the realistic things. They look at the facts and how those facts were covered. Mm -hmm. and right. And that was honestly what, what we focused on. That's actually a really good point. We did have a list of requirements, but <clears throat> because it was a, a honestly a one-time thing, first time doing it, the requirements were quite high level, the ones that were available to everybody. There was obviously uh, details as to how the data was being extracted and everything in the design documents. But in the requirements, it was get the data off of that server so it can no longer be accessed, put it in a new server, uh, don't delete it from the old server, it just had to be made invisible. There was, and But that was it, like it was very, it has to be an exact copy, it has to be transparent, uh, these users, there was a list of uh, users who would have to be transferred over, but it was it was quite specific and not honestly really helpful to show how we would show that it had been successfully copied over because it was the requirements ended up being mostly uh, at least the ones that that I saw was was mostly just the end user experience or the end product had to be a copy of the initial product. If there was a missing requirement, defer to it has to be the same as it was before. So that was it. It was the testing that became how do we show that it's the same as it was before. So we had lots of brainstorming sessions on, you know, what are the configurations? How can we show that all the data is there? Uh, we had uh, developers doing checksums on the on the sections of the database so that we could see we had the same uh, count of data, the same uh, elements. Uh, but then we had to show that it was also visibly the same, so that's what the testing team was doing. I will touch another subject now, a very sensible one, automation. Yes, I love automation. Yeah, sometimes I feel, I'm a programmer also, and I feel it's misused only for some confirmation and that's it, when it can be used also to refute the things. And as we were discussing yesterday with the acceptance criteria, that is more like confirmation but we also have to refute the things to disapprove those, not disapprove. To, to yeah, to try to show that the uh, the opposite isn't isn't happening. Yeah, yeah automation gets abused so frequently. Um, there's uh, lots of companies, and it seems to be getting more prevalent now, which is I find a disturbing trend. Uh, are trying to automate everything. They're thinking that they're going to save money, they're going to be able to reduce headcount, they're going to reduce risk uh, by having everything automated. Uh, but in honesty, automation is just doing the sanity checking. It can say, and I don't care if somebody says, no, we have really good automation. Okay, so you're doing a bit more than sanity checking, but you're still not able to explore, to learn, to uh, try to break the system, to react to things you've seen. Oh, I just saw a flicker. Oh, it seems to be taking a second longer than it did when I did this last time. Let me see if that means anything. And to be able to try to um, look for vulnerabilities and weaknesses and, and exploit them while the uh, automation is going to just check what it's told to check. So um, a friend of mine in Sweden had a story that he told me once uh, which I find quite amusing. They had an emergency call. They were creating a web page for a client, or updating a web page for a client, and they had an emergency call saying, "We need to update our web page this afternoon." I don't know why, but it was like you know maybe a sales promotion or something, or that has to be updated now. Please do it. And so they scrambled. They got it updated. They ran the automation, all green, pushed it to production. The phone rings. The guy says, "Where's my web page?" So they log on and the web page is gone. Not visible at all. They look and they look at the code and it was there, but it was all rendering into a single pixel. So somebody had made a mistake, uh, I'm not sure if it was in the CSS or somewhere else, but the entire web page was rendering in a single pixel in the corner, but it was all there. 
So the CSS selectors were there, there was all the text boxes were there, they were just invisible because they were all in a single pixel, but automation could handle it. So automation said, it's all good, it's all there, I can see it, I can enter the information, and the code was behaving properly if you were an automation person or if you looked at the code and you entered it in the code, you could do it. So if you went into your developer tools, you'd be able to use the website, but I don't think that's what they wanted. So uh, even though automation was all green, it was 100% useless. And that's an extreme example, but it's a, I, like to, I like that example because it's a good example as to how automation can get it wrong. That's perfectly usable, all the functionality is there, as long as you're an automation, uh, running it through automation. If you try to use it through the GUI, it wouldn't work at all. Yeah, and what is interesting is that the source of idea, like it's existing data, it's nothing new, in, usually in how, how automation is, is, is. This is one thing. The other thing is uh, how to spot the problems because we have these very checks, like it's the result is okay or not, but we we can use automation to verify some heuristics or some logs. Yes, yeah, actually that's a good point. So um, just I, I want to talk briefly about CICD and then I'll get into the tools in a second. With CICD, there's a few things that are vital for it to be working well. Uh, one is you need reliable automation. It can't be flaky. It can't fail and then that you run it again and it passes for no good reason except your timeouts are off by you know, a little bit it's your your automation needs to be tweaked so there's so many tools now in selenium and cypress and any other framework you can think of that allow you to wait for elements to be visible or present and uh and then click on them instead of putting in arbitrary timeouts which again are brittle doing more automation through api layers instead of the gui layers to, again to make them more resilient but having robust automation is important. Having the automation be fairly quick, at least the ones that are part of the pipeline, you can have more automation that you run outside of the pipeline, but you want your automation to be quick. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be checking what's important for the business, commonly used for the customers, and essentially uh, it needs to be giving you a good enough feeling that if that passes, then the code that we've just checked in is good enough for most of what our customers are gonna need it for. Can I say there's no bugs in it? No, but I can show that it's good enough. If it fits into that category, then CICD automation is going to be very beneficial for you. Until it's there, or if you have flaky automation that causes false failures, it's it, the time it takes to investigate the failure, you're either, you're either going to end up ignoring the failures and just going anyway because you say oh that one always fails which is not a good sign or uh, <clears throat> you'll end up delaying the deployment because you'll have to investigate the failure to see if it's a real failure or not so um, CICD automation is fantastic to get you to be able to deploy more rapidly and all that you still need to be testing whether you test in production immediately after deployment or testing in a staging environment before deployment it doesn't matter um, but then uh, to get to what you were saying, you can also use automation to help exploratory testers do things uh, that isn't part of an automation run where I click run and it does something. So as you indicated, manipulating data, um, doing uh, data transformation, which is fantastic, so that uh, things that people are tend to be bad at is repetitive, uh, attempt that requires um, extended attention to detail, but if a computer can do it well, then write a tool that does it for you. What is amazing is that in 2000, Tim Kainer, James Buck and others met each other and they were discussing about the same problem. So 22 years ago and now in 2022 is the same thing. And, yep. and the, uh, the, I'm not sure if it's the example you're talking about, but in, uh, in the 90s, they, uh, the first lost workshop happened, the Los Altos workshop on software testing, which was on, uh, it was the same people as Ken Kaner, James Bach, Elizabeth Hendrickson, Doug Hoffman. Um, they're the only ones I can know for sure were there off the top of my head. I'm sure I know others who were there. Uh, but it was a small group, probably 15-ish people, and they were 
trying to say how capture replay tools were being used beneficially because Kem had tried to use them and wasn't successful. James had tried to use them, wasn't successful. So they got a group of very smart software testers, some of the early thought leaders in our industry. And at the end of their conference, they determined that nobody was able to achieve the claims that the software vendors are uh, coming up with saying, capture replay will speed up your automation. It will speed up your deploy, you know, your testing and all that. And they couldn't make it work because either the software was flaky or the limitations of capture replay. Uh, and I'm still seeing that today. You go to any software testing conference and all of the booths are set up with the people, uh, the companies that are selling uh, low code, no code automation tools and they have claims and I've used a couple, which I won't mention right now, that are horrible, really hard to use. I legitimately just spent uh, about two months, a month ago, trying to get some data out of this uh, no code tool. And uh, it was very difficult to make it do what I wanted. I was unable to edit the script. Uh, and I mentioned it to them and, and their answer was, we're working on that in a future release, but okay, well, right now that doesn't help me. Uh, and I honestly feel that had I just used an open source tool like JUnit or something, I probably would have been able to get uh, an answer, better answer more quickly. So it was very frustrating. And to, to know that, as you said, 22, 25 years has gone by since the first lost meeting and we haven't as far as what marketing claims their products can do and what they can actually do, they're very disjointed. The trouble is the people making the decision to buy the tool believe the marketing. The people paying for the tool believe the marketing. And the people using the tool often have to lie that the tool is better than it is because they fear their jobs are on the line because their boss and the CFO have said, this is what we're using. I better make it good and they do their best, but everyone buys into these lies. And you touch another sensible point, which is also raised today about losing the job mm. of being a tester, an RST one, <clears throat> JIT or a context driven one. And this is very sensible because that tester will have to raise some points to apply the critical thinking in a certain way, maybe to be more tough. Yeah. So the tool that I was just using, I had no problem telling the VP who had made the purchase that I didn't like the tool, it wasn't doing it. I showed her the list of 12-ish bugs that I raised to the company. Uh, I didn't show her the list of the other seven or eight bugs that were just annoying, but didn't stop me from doing my work. And yeah, her argument was, well, can you still get some data out of it? And I said, I'd be able to get some data out of it. And she said, okay, that's good enough but I have been tasked with coming up with a better solution moving forward. Uh, so I'm going to do that. But the uh, if I was in a less senior position and I had given it to one of my junior uh, testers or an automation uh, tester, although for this one, an automation tester wouldn't help because it was a no code thing with no ability to edit the code. Um, blows my mind. Anyway, uh, a junior person may not have felt comfortable telling the VP of engineering that she had picked a bad tool and that I'm not able to get it to work. Everyone says it's easy to use. Everyone says that they can be up and running in two hours or three hours, whatever it is. And I can't, I've spent weeks on this and I still can't get it to do the simplest thing that I wanted to, well, that's not true. To do the simplest thing was easy. To do anything useful was almost impossible. And so, as you indicated, if I'm a junior person, I might lie. I might say, oh, I've been really busy, even though I've been working late trying to get it to go to justify that it's taking me uh, two weeks instead of a day. Uh, but uh, I, I was fortunate to, to be in a position of, I guess, seniority where I could, uh, and confidence where I didn't have to say, uh, the, you know, I could very comfortably say this product is bad 
as opposed to saying, I can't figure out how to use this product, maybe there's a problem with me. So I could easily see people who are given these tools that are told it's easy, look at their marketing, that they feel they have to lie or work overtime to get it working. And then uh, I know there's a steep learning curve for some of the better tools out there. Um, and once you get past that learning curve, they actually can be beneficial because they allow you to edit the code in that. But uh, yeah, you're, you're very much in a vulnerable situation when your boss, their boss, the CFO all think that you've been given an easy task and you're trying to come back and saying it's not doing what it should do, you're probably going to think you're going to get fired, which is very unfair. Have them watch this video. <laughs> yeah, I will do so. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I have observed, I'm a programmer, I work with a lot of senior ones. I never saw a senior one getting involved in this kind of automation. It's programmers. Did you notice this pattern also? That the um, anyone who's given these tools to use yeah. it tends to be the junior if, people? If, <clears throat> sometimes I feel that is what I perceived. Maybe I'm wrong. But all the senior programmers who have to implement the entire flow, they are software architecture and so on. It's not that they will... I didn't saw that they get involved in this kind of, of automation. Yeah, I, I can't think of any senior people who've been involved in it. I I've, Usually at the companies I've been involved at, uh, I've had a, enough of a say that we don't end up buying these types of tools. I'm much more of a proponent of uh, if you want the code to do what you want it to do, then you write the code because then you have full control over it. So at uh, the telecom company that I worked at for uh, 17 years, we had our own homegrown uh, program called APE, the Automation Programming Environment. It was written in Tickle, tool control language, uh, and it, uh, it was fantastic. It was honestly one of the best automation environments I've ever worked in. It had, uh, but it was all homegrown, but we had full control over everything. Uh, the, it was maintained internally, so if we wanted the log viewer to have anything different, we would just go to that team, and it was a small team of like two or three people who maintained it for the entire company. Uh, but it was fantastic. Uh, when we got bought by Alcatel, we actually ported Ape over um, to uh, some of the business units at Alcatel. And then uh, where I am now, we use just Visual Studio, Node.js, uh, again, full control over everything we want. Uh, it's not uh, the, the ease of use, I guess, of a tool that will let you just capture a script and then edit it. The ease, I guess, the benefit of having it give you a starting point which you can edit, I think is overshadowed by the fact that you know don't know how that was created. And you have to then interpret this code that's auto-generated to figure out where you are, where if you wrote it, you would know exactly where to go. It would have you know, the same look and feel as the rest of your environment, it would be easier to do. So um, this is the first time, this, this tool here is the first time that I've used a, a no-code tool. And let's just say, I hope it's the last. <laughs> and I do want to just briefly mention last October, so October 2021, Michael Bolton uh, wrote a blog on another no-code uh, tool, um, uh, Mabel, uh, which he did a big blog post on. I'll let you go read that. Where people can find out more about you, the next events you have, classes? Well, if I say the next events and someone's watching this in a year, they'll all be disappointed that they weren't there. But oh. I am going to be at CAST uh, in San Diego in, uh, in August of 2022, this year. Uh, I'm going to be at CAST and I'm also going to be at Agile Testing Days in November and Agile Testing Days in USA in May 2023. And you have also a blog? I have a blog, but I haven't updated it in, geez, I think it was 2016 was the last time I wrote a blog. You chucked, didn't you? It was 2016. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there are some good posts there, things like... Uh, Functional uh, specification blinders, killer interview questions. I, 
uh, still get visitors to the site because every so often I get a report uh, that says I had so many visitors, it still amazes me. But there are some good blog posts on it, but the blog is testingthoughts.com. Thank you a lot, Paul, for accepting and speaking with us. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.